Hello, my name is Tom Voitem and in this presentation I will be talking about uh, timeless time index. So our research that we did uh, where we explored how um, exploiting concurrency can lead to leaking secrets over remote connections. So this has been a collaborative effort between uh, me and Wat Riosen from uh, the University of Leuven in Belgium uh, from the Disnet group and uh, Christina Pupper and Mati van Hoof from uh, NYU Abu Dhabi. So let's first explore how a typical time index works these days. Um, so the attacker simply sends a request to the server and measures the time it takes before a response arrives. Um, usually the attacker will uh, need multiple measurements uh, because well, there might be some jitter and uh, the attacker stores this information in a, a database and then makes a second request. So here you can see that there was a, well, a short delay on the third network hop and that resulted in uh, well, a larger time of the request. Um, so here we, uh, this request took four uh, seconds and 48 milliseconds, so slightly higher. Um, so the attacker will probably have to make quite a lot of these requests. Um, so we explored exactly how many the requests, uh, how many requests the attacker required, uh, based on um, well the connection between our university network and a server located at AWS, um, and we well imposed a maximum of one hundred thousand requests, and we saw. Um, that's, for instance, a timing difference between two processing tasks with a difference of 50 microseconds uh, required 333 requests uh, in order to determine this. Um, between well, our university um, server and a server located in the EU. Um, and we see that, well, the smaller the timing difference becomes, uh, the more number of uh, requests are required. So for 10 microseconds, it's already up to 23,220 requests for uh, the EU. Uh, we also see that, well, the longer the network path, um, the more requests are required. So between our server and the server located in the US, uh, we can only determine a timing difference of up to uh, 20 microseconds. And going even further, so to Asia, um, it well, we could only determine uh, a timing difference of 50 microseconds, uh, requiring more than 7,000 requests. So we, well, in this presentation and in our paper, we introduce a new concept of uh, time index. So we kind of try to change the paradigm and um, we call these the timeless time attack, timing attacks. Um, so we well, find that well, the relying on absolute response timing is not really feasible for an adversary um, as it will include uh, jitter for every request. So we thought, why not just get rid of the notion of time? So that's why we call these attacks the timeless time attacks. Um, so instead of relying on the sequential timing measurements, we instead introduce concurrency and we only consider the response order. So this means that we do not look at any, uh, any notion of time. Um, and we just see uh, by sending two requests at the same time which one comes arise first. Um, and this makes that our timeless time index are uh, unaffected completely by any network chatter. So let's see how this works in uh, this schema. Uh, so the attacker constructs two requests uh, to two different processing tasks, one where which is considered the baseline where the attacker knows how long it takes. Um, and then he sends these uh, to the server, uh, but he constructs them in such a way that they will arrive simultaneously at the server. Um, so this can be done by placing them into a single, uh, in a single network packet. Um, we can see that the light blue 
response was generated first. Uh, so this means that the associated processing task look, took less time uh, than the dark blue one. Um, and we see that even if there is some network jitter, the uh, request still arrives simultaneously at the server. Um, and then our process in the same way and um, our sense also based on, well, here we can see that the response order again leaks information about uh, which task was uh, finished processing first. So in order to apply our uh, timeless time index, there are three requirements. So the first one is that the, well, we send two requests at the same time uh, and they need also to arrive at exactly the same time at the server. Um, and well, afterward they arrive, they need to be processed concurrently. And uh, third requirement is that the response order uh, needs to reflect a difference in execution time. So um, well, for modern servers, they typically al already process requests concurrently. And um, well, the difference in the response order is all well, the third requirement is typically also met because uh, servers will typically uh, respond as soon as possible. Um, and then for the first requirement, uh, we can we have two options. So either we can leverage uh, multiplexing, uh, where we uh, ensure that well there are two um, requests into a, in a single packet that will be well, multiplexed at the protocol level and then process simultaneously. So in this case, uh, we can do that with HTTP2. Um, and then the other option is by using a form of uh, encapsulation at the network protocol level. Um, so for this, we can abuse store uh, because if we can create two different TCP connections, uh, which where if we send packets over these uh, two different connections, Tor will uh, encapsulate these in two different Tor cells, and they, uh, well, two Tor cells can still fit to in a single uh, TCP packet. So then we uh, evaluated how many requests or request pairs in case of concurrency based or the timeless time index um, we actually require. So we can see the figures from EU, US, and Asia from before. And on the right hand side, you can see the results of the concurrency time attacks. So you can see um, that the, for the 10 microseconds, which was the smallest one uh, that we could determine for remote time attacks, uh, we only need 11 request pairs instead of the well, 23,220 uh, for the server in the EU. So that's a significant improvement. And we also see when we look at uh, the smallest difference that we can measure uh, for time. So for the remote time index, it was 10 microseconds. We also performed similar uh, measurements for uh, attacks against a uh, server located on the same local area network and on the local host. There we could determine a difference of 150 milliseconds, or uh, sorry, 150 nanoseconds. And um, for our concurrency time index, we can already determine a difference of 100 nanoseconds. So that's also, um, well, I think quite impressive. So these uh, Timeless time index can be applied in different type of scenarios. Uh, so either through a direct time attack, a cross-site time attack, uh, where the victim is the one uh, sending requests to the server and the attacker measures the response order uh, using JavaScript. And then we also manage to attack uh, a Wi-Fi handshake, um, so the EAP. EAP PWD, um, which and um, which was which was previously uh, considered un, well, impossible to exploit. 
So this brings me to the conclusion. Um, so our new type of time index, so the concurrency based or timeless time index are uh, completely unaffected by uh, network jitter, um, which makes it possible to perform uh, remote time index with an accuracy that is similar to an attack against the local system. Um, so uh, attacks can be launched uh, by exploiting uh, several uh, mechanisms at the network protocol, so either by leveraging uh, multiplexing or uh, by leveraging uh, encapsulation of another network protocol. Um, so we find that all protocols that meet these criteria are susceptible uh, to concurrency-based time attacks. Uh, we created practical attacks against uh, HTTP2, EAP, PWD for Wi-Fi, and then uh, HTTP1 over Tor. Um, for future work, we think it's can be very interesting to perform a more extensive evaluation of uh, network protocols that uh, might be susceptible to our uh, new type of attacks. Um, so this concludes the presentation. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me or uh, the other authors. Uh, you can find my contact details on this slide.